Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the R Friday Morning Coffee Expert Speaker Conference Call with Mr. Abhinav Thakur, Managing Director at Acurex Biomedical, hosted by Reliance Securities Limited. As a reminder, all participants' lines will be in listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star and zero on your touchtone phone. Please note this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Binod Modi, Research Analyst at Reliance Securities. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you. Hello, everyone. On behalf of Reliance Securities, I welcome you all to our R Friday Expert Speaker Access. Today we have Mr. Abhinav Thakur with us. Mr. Thakur, a graduate from University of California, is currently serving as MD of Acurex. Acurex is a pioneer in the medical devices industry in India. Mr. Thakur, also being an active member of the Association of India Medical Devices, has a very deep insight about the diagnostics as well as the medical devices industry. Now, I request Mr. Thakur to share his initial remarks about the broad outlook of the sector, and then we'll open the floor for, a, for the Q&A. Over to you, sir. Yes, thank you. And uh, I will start with giving you a broad outlook about the sector. So a lot of your queries that you have, I will try to address it uh, during my introduction about our industry and our segment of uh, diagnostics. And after that, we can move on to the questions that you have so I can address the specific questions. So I'll give you an overall uh, view. So I'm uh, running this company called Accurate Biomedical. We are into the manufacture of reagents which are supplied to pathology labs. So our target uh, customers are the tier 2 labs. Which uh, So the market is broken up into 50% is the unorganized sector, 15% is the lab chains like Thyrocare, Metropolis, SRL, and Dr. Lal's. These contribute to 15% of the market share. And the remaining 35% of the market share is hospitals. And this includes large hospitals and also smaller hospitals and nursing homes are also included in this. So you could have a nursing home that is 20 bedded and going up to a hospital that is 500 bedded, which contributes to 35% of the market. So you can see the majority of the market lies in the unorganized sector. And this is the sector we operate in, applying to these customers. Because in the organized sector, where the large lab chains are there, there are only four major players. So there is Roche, who is the market leader, followed by uh, Siemens, and uh, then there is Beckman Coulter and Abbott. So these four companies are dominant players, almost holding, you could say, about 90 to 95% of the market share in the organized sector because they have large instruments. So they have large hardware, which is available technology only with these four players, and the cost is extremely high. So they are able to place these large instruments or hardware on reagent rental. So what happens is they give the instruments free, and then it's like a lease model. So the labs buy the reagents from them, and the cost of the instrument, the finance cost, is built into the purchase of the consumable. So because only the technology is available with these four players, and they have the financial strength to put these large instruments which cost more than crores uh, on reagent rental, they are able to dominate in this market and it's extremely hard for new players to come into this segment. And um, our, all the technology of all these four players is coming from Japan. So Japan is where the market is highly advanced and the technologies are available and they are given the marketing rights of their products to these four large players who are selling their products on their own brand. So that's the breakup of the customers for us. So we are targeting the 50% of the market and you could say the smaller hospitals. So which would be about 10 to 15% of the 35% market share of hospitals. So the total target audience for us is about 60 to 65% of the market share. We are operating in this segment and this segment has more competitors compared to the chain labs, which have only four major suppliers. So in this segment, you have a lot of companies. So 
In India, the regulation is not as strict, so we have a lot of companies who are manufacturing, and also there is no regulation at all for labs. So today, anybody can start a lab without accreditation. Accreditation certification is voluntary in India, and you are, all you need is a shops and establishment license. So the lab hence are very unorganized since there is no licensing or accreditation certification requirement as there is in other countries. So this leads to labs providing lower quality results, which again leads to them purchasing lower quality and the cheapest or cheaper products from the market, which again leads to a lot of manufacturers being there who are not able to provide quality products at a low price. So the more the regulation comes in to the country, the quality will improve and that will help uh, players like us who have been in the market for the last 35 years since we have been providing quality products and hence they have been in the market for a long time having an all India presence. There are many smaller companies in our segment who are operating only in one state because the cost of operations is low since the regulatory requirements are there and the market is also accepting substandard products. So they are able to operate in a particular state. So this is the breakup of our market and we come under the medical device sector. The size of the Indian product market of the services market is about $1 billion and the total potential market for us in India is $10 billion. And we come under the medical device sector. So this sector is currently doing extremely well because overall because of Ayushman Bharat scheme. So the sector is currently at $11 billion in medical devices which includes diagnostic and orthopedic and consumables and medical electronics. So this is completely put together as $11 billion and is expected to grow to $50 billion by 2025. So you can see a high growth rate of 9 to 11% CHGR for the next five years which is going to come in here. Currently India is the fourth largest market in Asia. And so there is a lot of companies are interested in entering into India and with the Invest India and the Make in India benefits that are going to come in. For example, the government has made foreign direct investment automatic without any approvals into the medical device industry to encourage manufacturing. And there is also four medical device parks which have come up, which are giving incentives to companies to come and set up their manufacturing plants in India. So this is again on a boost. And the most recent post-COVID is a production linked incentive which provides financial incentives for production of medical devices and the government has earmarked $456 million as incentive for manufacturers to start manufacturing because today 80% of the products in India are imported and the government says that this can also affect the national security of our country since during the COVID pandemic, India had a shortage of medical devices since the medical devices were sold to developed countries at a much higher price. So India couldn't buy these products from the manufacturers in other countries. So the government decided that they will focus on this as this is linked to national security. The new defense now is healthcare. So they earmarked more than $56 million. And there's a new rule that has come in which is all first April it was in and all medical devices are going to be regulated now. So this is a good rule because it will help improve the overall quality of the products in the country since all the products are regulated and lower quality products will not be able to enter the market as easily as they are entering now because there's absolutely no regulation and they don't need registration, they don't need to submit any quality control data or anything. So with the regulation coming in, it's also a blessing uh, since it will help players like us to give high quality products. And uh, there's a 100% FDI, which makes uh, India currently 63rd in ease of doing business. So this 100% uh, you know, FDI has increased the ease of doing business here. 
So that's about the medical device sector, and uh, we are the subset in the sector as a diagnostic. And uh, uh, recently, during the COVID, the diagnostic industry has been in the spotlight, which was never there before. If you look at the news, the media, the, everyone is talking about antigen testing, antibody testing, RT-PCR testing, which were never known, which were words in Latin, I would say, to the layman. But today, even the layman knows the difference between RT-PCR, antigen, and antibody. So I see a lot of awareness building up in the market. And this awareness is also going to stay post-COVID. And people are going to go for more health checkups because they understand what these tests are and what is the significance of these tests. So earlier, people used to do diagnostic testing only after the age of 40 because that's when the doctor told them that, okay, you need to start doing an annual checkup. But now because the general public who had never been to the lab, the young people, are now aware of diagnostic labs and are also more aware about their health. So I believe the health awareness that has been created due to the pandemic is going to help increase the size of the market. So the demand of the product is driven by the higher growth in the laboratory market. And the supply of the product is broken up into the two tiers as the big four and then the other players. And the current update is with COVID, we saw most of our customers not being open because of the lockdown. And a lot of them were not sure how to come to work with the PPEs, uh, with the different uh, standard operating procedures. So a lot of them were closed. There, a lot of their migrant labor went back. So a lot of them were not open during the lockdown. So that uh, led to uh, the revenues coming down. And I think uh, more. this has affected the entire healthcare industry, not only us, also hospital revenues have come down, OPD has come down, and diagnostics is based on prescriptions. So the doctor prescription is what drives the diagnostic business. And since uh, OPD was shut for a long time, the diagnostic business also came down. Now we had a degrowth compared to last year, year on year of 15%. We were able to uh, not come down more because we launched certain uh, COVID-related products. We started manufacturing hand sanitizers, and we started trading in thermometers, masks, and face shields. So that helped us to fill the vo void a little bit. But if you look at the big labs, Metropolis has grown by 30%. In the first quarter, Harrow Care by 50%. And uh, SRL uh, has come down again by 50% and Dr. Lal's only by one third. So this, the reason behind this is because Dr. Lal's at Metropolis is focused more on the specialty testing. So they do more high-end molecular diagnostics, oncology related testing. So the demand for that cannot come down because a cancer patient has to get the testing done. But for example, a health checkup can be delayed. Elective procedures can be delayed. So that's why we saw the revenue dropping more of the labs doing the routine test compared to the labs doing the specialized test. Even though COVID testing has increased and we're looking at like two lakh to five lakh tests being done a day, but most of these tests are being done by the government and the private labs are doing less tests than the government. And also there's a price cut going on the test. So even if you are a high quality lab versus another lab who is not following the quality procedure, you can only charge the same amount. So this is not uh, made it a profitable business, especially for labs who have a higher operating cost and are providing better quality services because of the different certifications that they have, like NABL and the US certificate for quality called the CAP. So all the big uh, four have the CAP uh, certificate, which the smaller players don't have. And getting a CAP certificate is costly affair. So COVID has not uh, really filled in the gap for them. 
and we saw the same thing happening with us also because the government has banned, restricted the sale of COVID related diagnostic products and uh, also sanitizers and masks. They recently lifted this uh, export of only uh, sanitizers without a uh, push pump because there's a shortage of push pumps uh, in India, dispensers in India. And uh, they recently just lifted the PPE exports restriction, but there's a certain quota, and after the quota, you're not allowed to export. For masks, there's still a ban on exports and you're allowed to only export a non-medical mask. So due to these different price controls and restrictions or bans on export, the pricing in the market has come down. Uh, also for COVID diagnostic tests, the, the export is, is not allowed right now. So the, we are seeing a lot of uh, price competition coming to the market. And uh, this price is gonna uh, keep coming down. So it's not gonna uh, stay where it is. So, for example, if there's an antibody test that is costing about 200 or 250 rupees to the lab to buy, it's going to come down and the lowest I would expect it to go to is even 20 rupees. And uh, then as the price goes down, even the labs will uh, reduce the cost and there'll be more testing happening as the volumes will increase. And uh, I've seen, as you've seen everywhere, digitalization has played an important role during the pandemic and labs with a strong online presence are going to benefit more because a lot of the patients who are at home are looking up labs which are available online and have a strong presence online. So there's a lot of merger and acquisitions also happening in our industry. So we have seen 15 mergers happening since the start of 2018 in the lab chain business where the large lab chains have acquired those uh, standalone labs and there's also mergers the acquisitions that have happened in the medical device and the medical diagnostics manufacturing sector so in the medical diagnostics manufacturing the acquisitions have been all by MNCs because they want to get a footprint in the country and they get uh, ready made brownfield acquisition they can make into the country. So they have acquired companies into India. So there have been Japanese companies that have wanted to enter India. So they have acquired companies in the Indian manufacturing sector. And then there's a large player in the US, Perkin Elmer. They made a large acquisition in India, the most recent acquisition. And then there have been private equity investments which have happened in in a couple of players and the most uh, recent one uh, due to COVID there was a large investment made by Motilal uh, Oswal in a diagnostic company that is manufacturing the molecular diagnostics for COVID testing and uh, there has been an investment by Serum Institute of India into a company that has been manufacturing RT-PCR tests to help them scale up the testing since it was a startup so Serum India as Serum Institute of India has invested money for them to help scale them up in the art in the manufacturing. So we see a lot of interest coming to the sector by people, companies who are not present. So even the large pharma companies have applied for licenses to start manufacturing diagnostic tests. So for example, Cadilla has started manufacturing diagnostic tests and there are other companies who are in the process to start doing the same. And with the recent entry of uh, Reliance coming into the picture with uh, the acquisition of NetMed, I think there's going to be a disruption that the online uh, player is going to make a big difference because a lot of the test is commoditized. So if you look at the protein testing, for example, your sugar test or your lipid test, that is your cholesterol triglycerides, it has become a more of a commodity market. So if Reliance is able to push these tests through with uh, digital platform, it's going to be able to disrupt the market. And there, are, there was also news that Reliance might come in and start its own lab. So that's again going to be a big disruption because Reliance is known for uh, causing price disruption and reducing the price of the test. So this could be another disruption we could be seeing in the future. And with the geo acquiring that might 
I think they have made the move and they will continue to invest more in the healthcare sector. And the opportunities that we see ahead is there is a big opportunity for exports. So if you look at the Indian pharma industry, which is we are an allied industry as a pharma. The pharma, India is the pharmacy of the world. So there's a huge opportunity for us to start manufacturing medical devices in India as the cost arbitrage that we have over the developed countries is very high in the medical devices. So we can leverage this since a lot of technical skill is required and technical skill of engineers and graduates, postgraduates, PhDs is much lower in India than developed countries. So this can be a great opportunity for exports. Like in pharma, about the ratio is one is to one. So exports is a great opportunity. The other opportunity is definitely Ayushman Bharat coming in and you know sponsoring a lot of the tests which is going to be done as the wellness center is going to be a big push and the wellness centers are going to come up in the country which are going to provide free diagnostic testing. So this is going to be another opportunity. And so general awareness that is going to go up and um, insurance is going to go up significantly because of COVID as the, the government has passed regulations that insurance is mandatory for a corporate company. So as insurance goes up, I see a lot of uh, opportunities coming up. Concerns and challenges in our industry. So the challenge is regulatory. As we see uh, regulatory coming in, there might be a lot of small players who might not be able to afford the cost of regulation. So this uh, could be a, a threat coming into the future that the uh, companies need to be prepared for. So this is uh, the challenge and also the same challenge is the lack of regulation right now because due to lack of regulation there are much uh, lower quality service providers who in turn buy low quality products and this affects the, the companies who have a brand and who are providing high quality uh, reports. So this is another challenge that comes in. And the large uh, challenge that comes in is also the interlinking of the prescription with the labs. So there's a reference fees that goes on and that causes the cost of the test to go up. But it doesn't benefit the patient. So there needs to be, I think, uh, or more solid structure that will try to avoid this from happening and this will benefit the patient so that the unnecessary testing doesn't happen. So I feel uh, these are the main uh, concerns and challenges facing the industry. So with this, uh, I would like to open up to any specific questions you have to know more about the industry in general or anything specifically. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on your touchstone phone now. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking our question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles to ask a question. At this time, please press star followed by one on your touchstone phone now. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star one. We have a first question from the line of Vinod Modi from Reliance Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, thanks for, you know, the detailed uh, I mean, uh, this, uh, I'm sharing outlook in terms of outlook. 
just uh, i wanted to oh. know certain about uh, uh, this uh, diagnostic sector sir so to by understanding diagnostic if i look at if i can i, I can segregate it in two parts you know pathology and imaging imaging is nothing but scanning oh. and everything right, right. so right. if you can just uh, briefly uh, i mean uh, you can uh, oh. guide me the kind of opportunity between these two segments it would be better so the, because i understand the pathology i think most of the organized players they are mainly into pathology and the imaging part the, the oh. or, or organized like the as you said doctor lal and all these are into the imaging part and all so if you can briefly guide me the kind of opportunity yeah, yeah. at least as you said ki 10 11% cagr opportunities you are seeing in the medical devices mm. so which kind of opportunities are coming in these two sides sir so the opportunities if you look at the pathology is a bigger market share than imaging and in pathology it is easier to scale up so to scale up what do you need to do you just need to go ahead and in page of footprints you need to open more collection points so for example you want to get into a remote territory like say arunachal pradesh so what you need to do is open a collection center collect samples and send it to your regional hub hub in kolkata and get it tested and provide the results to the patients in arunachal pradesh but in imaging that is not possible you need to have the hardware Yeah. the radiology equipment at arunachal pradesh so that increases your cost of capital and that as your cost of capital goes up and there's not enough workload to do the imaging your cost per imaging goes up so the break even happens at a much later age and the investment is large compared to expanding in pathology so that's the key difference so you are not seeing a lot of uh, organized players getting to this segment since the regional players or the regional imaging labs have a much stronger hold in this and a lot of imaging also happens inside hospitals so that's the reason you're not seeing uh, chain labs coming up with imaging okay uh so uh, does it also a uh, link to the kind uh, the india demographics sir if i talk about let's say ki millennial all millennial i think a big population of millennial age of now right they mm-hmm. might after 10 years 5 year 10 years they may you know there would be kind of you know aging population that time so the mm-hmm. kind of opportunity that exists as of now in this medical devices uh, right this opportunity can be higher in this diagnostic part than going forward yeah. in terms of incremental growth that is what i'm saying with, with the aging right. population in india so the younger population as per a survey the testing starts after the age of 40 the mm-hmm. annual checkups right that's when your doctor tells you okay now it's time to start doing the annual checkups so mm-hmm. we are saying that uh, after the age of 40 is when the person or the population starts testing much more so that's mm-hmm. the reason you look at japan right they have a aging population so that's mm-hmm. the reason it is a large segment of the world diagnostic market so it comes in the top 3 diagnostic market right so it comes right right yeah uh, number 2 in uh, asia because of the aging population so as the population ages the uh, the market uh, increases because of the uh, more testing is being done mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah i got it fair point sir and you uh, and sir in your remark you also said about the mna thing 15 mna has already mm. happened in india from 2018 mm. of course i understand because if i even look at the number some of the global companies and even the indian companies the growth for them has mainly come from the inorganic expansion right mm. so uh, of course it's been there you know core strategy to grow so i just wanted to understand sir you know uh, in terms of synergies how to look look for you know, the synergy for you know acquiring any you know other mm. you know organized or unorganized company so i just wanted to understand from a synergy point of view if anyone goes for the mna part mm. so you look at the growth uh, strategy so some of the players are looking at mna as a growth strategy and mm-hmm. some of the players are looking at organic growth so for example you compare thyrocare and metropolis so thyrocare doesn't do any mna they are growing at a high rate without mna and just on organic growth they are disrupting the market with the lower pricing and that's how they are able to grow at a good rate and metropolis on the other hand is the master in mna and they have been doing mna from the very time of i think 2005 is when they have become very active after they got the private equity investment so that was it made it possible for them to do the mna so metropolis has been successful in the mna strategy and it's a it's a good strategy to grow fast because 
you get the existing lab and you get the existing relationship. So if you see, right. the diagnostic business is based on the relationship between the lab and the doctor, the prescribing doctor. So those relationships are very hard to build in the short term. So when you buy or you purchase the lab, you also get the relationships with that. So that helps in the growth. Okay, got it. And last about this medical devices that you said 95% you know market share right is being you know catered through these two, three four players you know that that two you know are global players right so in short mm -hmm. in India in India I mean we have hardly any any players in organized segment which is catering this part this mm -hmm. segment, right so mm -hmm. this is mainly because of the regulatory hurdle that in India as of now or was there any other region that you can no. highlight so there is 95 percent of the organized sector so 15 percent is the total market size of the chain labs yes, yes. and out of in this 15 percent 95 percent is or yeah, is serviced by these four large players so the hurdle is not about regulation the hurdle is so if you look at a large lab they will get about say thousand plus samples right in yeah. a day i'm talking about an average uh, large lab and like la la labs like arrow care metropolis can get even much more like 50,000 samples probably right right so if you look at the thousand tests right there are the hardware cost is extremely high and mm -hmm. to make that hardware you need special technology special technology and accuracy where the accuracy is hard to get because of the high number of tests the machine can do and this technology is the limiting factor which is available in Japan and Japan is the market leader in this technology but however Japan Japanese company is not able to market their products they're very good at manufacturing the products so they're given the license to these European companies or American companies to sell their products under their brand name Right. So the limiting factor is not uh, got to do with regulation. The only limiting factor here is got to do with finance, because you should be able to place these large instruments on the uh, region rentals and technology. So first is the technology. Once you get the technology, then you need to have the finance to uh, to enter the market. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Thanks. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. To ask a question, participants are press star one. We have next question from the line of Satish Ramanathan from JM Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, sir. I uh, just wanted to understand uh, what the government policy of this national database uh, having unique health records on the database. And so is it possible that the doctor just prescribes uh, uh, the generic drug and uh, a prescription for the medical test? and the patient can in turn shop around for the lowest cost test uh, from the approved database and uh, mm. the test details are then loaded onto the database. So uh, in, in a way they control the cost because they want national insurance, they want to uh, protect the cost of the, I mean the livelihood of poor people and they don't want uh, healthcare costs to erode their savings because there are I mean, while we may agree that most people are doing a genuine business, there are also unscrupulous elements uh, which lead to this kind of a situation. So uh, in, in every aspect, they can control the cost for the patient and then give a backstop from the insurance side. So uh, the insurance can be a generic insurance, which probably can be a one lakh rupee insurance for uh, people below the poverty, poverty line and then they say that you pay 500 rupees for uh, the test and all the other tests will be taken care of by us so the government will pay the uh, test company the database is loaded and this uh, person can then go for uh, you know medical counseling anywhere in the country hmm. because it is in his control he has the uh, uh, records of uh, linked to his Aadhaar card of all the diagnostic tests and the uh, x-rays and whatever else and the doctor prescriptions as well as the uh, recommendations. So uh, do you see that kind of a situation because what is happening right now is that we have uh, consolidation as you had rightly said but with consolidation you can 
then port all this data into a central database rather than a fragmented market because today we can go to a mom and pop shop and get our blood sugar and uh, uh, cholesterol done but nobody knows uh, six months later we repeated because that record is neither maintained by the patient hmm. nor by the doctor nor by the uh, the uh, person who provided the service hmm. so is uh, what is your view do you see this coming okay. and becoming a very powerful driver so this national health digitalization was announced very recently on 15th august and it has been rolled out in i believe six union territories first as a pilot run and then it will be rolled out into the other states mm. and uh, this uh, is voluntary you need to understand it's not uh, mandatory for the private company currently okay. it is only mandatory for the government healthcare okay okay so over a period of time uh, what would drive it to become mandatory is probably in insurance company so if a insurance company will say i'll give you cashless service only if you are linked to the national health digitalization so hmm. that is what could drive incentivize the private sector to get on this and the main objective of this is electro uh, electronic record management hmm. so the objective is to benefit the patient so that they have all the documents past test reports available so when they go to another doctor everything is available you don't need to repeat the test again right okay. you don't uh, lose your documents you have the entire history so it is more about the benefit to the patient as having your entire history so if a child is born the entire record from the birth to the death of the person is going to be on the file so what were the illnesses the person faced as a child what was the treatment given so a doctor even after 15 years when he is looking at the case history he can get the data of what could have led to the current situation would be could it be something that was during the pregnancy there was certain issue so it is more about the patient focus right now but it will definitely bring in transparency into the system which will help in what we were referring about you know, different hospitals like we have seen cases in the media where you know patients have been charged 60 lakh you know for just uh, covid treatment uh, being in the hospital and uh, pp gets 60 yeah. yeah so there have been reports like that uh, and pp kits are being sold at 2000 rupees in the billing while the purchase price is about 500 300 rupees so this will bring in transparency into the entire system and that will take time because right now it's voluntary right so once insurance is an incentive it will help uh, companies and good intentioned companies who are anyway transparent will come on board and that will incentivize other people to come on board and that will make the patient also want to visit the healthcare facilities that are on this system so that's the main objective is driven by the patient history to be in one place and the by product will be transparency and pricing and the growth okay no but uh, uh, do you see the uh, uh, entire industry uh, expanding in numbers but contracting in per patient revenue because of this it may be oh. still a growth for yeah. uh, this thing for the industry but uh, what will happen is uh, where i was paying probably uh, mm. uh, 1000 rupees for a test it may become 700 or 600 rupees okay. and but the volumes will be probably become four times or five times what uh, the uh, current volume is right so where i see it expanding the industry is the insurance industry will get more confidence on the system because today the system is so opaque that you know the charges are so different between the different hospitals but once the system is transparent and the insurance company knows okay these are the cost etc so that will give more penetration of insurance is what i believe and that will grow the market okay and uh, so you believe that insurance will be the most powerful driver uh, in this entire industry rather than uh, anything else and and uh, so why i'll tell you why because 70% of the healthcare cost is out of pocket and only 30% is insurance 
Hmm. So in the US, you look at it, every 90% is insurance. And US is the largest healthcare market in the world. So as the insurance goes up, people start taking more preventive actions towards their health. And even the insurance companies want the people to be healthy. So they incentivize by giving tests to the people who are their customers. So overall, the market grows with insurance. The uh, uh, current COVID uh, crisis uh, has you know, kind of put actually the government hospitals in a better light than what the public used to think about them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they have been more reasonable, kinder, and more gentle on the patients than the pri private sector. So uh, do you think that uh, with this kind of a shift in sentiment, that there is a bigger role for public sector uh, healthcare? Hmm. So I personally believe public uh, healthcare is uh, silver bullet, is what's going to give the best uh, healthcare delivery because there is no conflict of interest. The doctor hmm. who's treating you in a public center has no uh, conflict of interest. He is going to treat you and uh, his salary is going to be coming from the combat itself, right? Correct. Not on based on anything else. And if you look at the countries which have been the most successful in the healthcare index are the Scandinavian countries in Europe, which is completely uh, public driven. So this again is going to be driven only by government policy. So the current uh, Ayushman Bharat, it is actually driving the private sector by providing the reimbursement to the private sector. And there have been a lot of cases of uh, fraud happening where there are ghost patients and the reimbursements are done or treatments which are not required they are done and the government has blacklisted these hospitals who have done so and so so i feel the way forward for any country like you look at uh, the united kingdom also which has one of the best uh, healthcare systems with the uh, national health authority over there and that is because it is public health care. So there is completely no conflict of interest between the doctor, the patient, or the insurance company. And uh, the patient gets the best uh, treatment that way. But India is the other way. In India, you know, 70% is uh, private and 30% is uh, the government like public health care infrastructure currently in the country. But with the COVID uh, testing, coming to the point of COVID testing. So the government, uh, the reason people don't go to government hospitals is because of the quality issues. So you see there's an irony right now in the COVID testing rules. So a private lab is mandatory to have NABL accreditation, which is a quality system for lab uh, pathology laboratory. Right. But this same rule doesn't apply to government labs. So government lab without a NABL accreditation without the certificate from NHL is allowed to do the uh, COVID-19 RT-PCR test. So in a way, this is not giving a level playing ground. And what could be the reason? The reason it could be because it would be hard for the government labs to get the certification because of the limited resources they have. So they have limited resources, which is also a problem on the ground. They have limited manpower. They have limited resources, mm -hmm. which is, makes it probably harder for them to get the certification. So as an investor, where should uh, uh, an investor put his resources? Do you think he should focus on the uh, insurance side as a way to capture the entire healthcare chain? Or should he focus on the um, medical uh, equipment business? Or should he focus on the... Uh, you know, the diagnostics chain, or should you focus on mm. uh, the hospitals? So if you look at it in terms of the profit, right? So the diagnostic uh, labs, I would say chains or standalone labs, have a much higher uh, ROC than even the manufacturers. Because the manufacturers in the end are a B2B business. And okay. the chains are more into B2C. So whoever is closer to the customer always has the pricing power right so because we are in a b2b we don't have a strong uh, pricing power because the customer always has the option to you know negotiate and go different different uh, 
suppliers. But in a B2C, the patient has limited options and a lot of times his options are limited because of the prescription. So if you are, for example, in a hospital, right, you don't have an option but to get the test done in the hospital. And okay. the hospital rates, that's why are higher than the rates which are outside. So the hospital labs are the most profitable labs. And then even the standalone labs, because the doctor will say that I don't trust a report from another lab. You know, only go to XYZ lab because I've been working with them, they have high quality. So again, the patient's choices are limited. So he has to visit that lab and he is happier and he trusts his doctor that, okay, you know, I will go and visit this lab or the lab has a very good brand name. So some people will visit only a certain lab. So that makes the lab have a very strong pricing power. And the more specialized the lab gets, so the more specialized the testing they get, the less of the competition. So for example, okay. there are 4,000 tests that can be done. Right? And out of these 4,000 tests on the human body, a lot of them are routine testing. But a lot of them are so specialized that only few players, I would say, like a couple of players or maybe five players who have them in the market. So that again gives them a pricing advantage. So I would say pathology labs as they have a very high advantage on uh, pricing power. Okay. And uh, in, in terms of the super specialized labs, we, how do you rate uh, the mm -hmm. current set of listed entities and unlisted entities? Right. Whom would you? So the business model, uh, if you look at the business model itself, right? So. Dr. Lal was one of the first pioneers in specializing testing. It started, I think, in the 40s or something like that. And I've been there for a long time. And it was started by Dr. Lal's father. And then Dr. Lal came into it over and then grew the business. So it was the first uh, lab in India that started doing the specialized testing. And they, uh, they are in, they, their focus is on uh, specialized testing and also routine testing. So they do both. And then you have uh, SRL, which is also into specialized testing. Right? It's not a listed player right now. So uh, there, there's no investment option in SRL currently. And Metropolis also, as a strategy, is into specialized testing and routine testing. But they are driving their growth through specialized testing because they understand that if there's a cancer patient, he's not going to go to a lower end lab to just save 100 or 500 rupees. He's going to go to a lab that he trusts. So their strategy is driven by getting more into specialized testing. On the other hand, you look at thyroid they are more driven by the general testing, like the thyroids or your lipid profile, kidney profile. And they believe that they can have an edge in that market because of the volumes. So today, the kind of volumes he does in thorough care, other companies are not doing, and that's why they're able to get extremely low pricing in the market from their vendors. They, are, they have a higher negotiation power because of the volumes. And that lets them disrupt the market and get the business from other labs. So they are a B2B model where okay. they other labs outsource their testing to ThyroCare because it's cheaper to get the testing done in ThyroCare and report it back than to do the testing in the lab. So mm -hmm. these are different uh, business models that uh, the labs are following. Okay. Fine. I, I get what you're saying. But uh, our concern as investors is that there would be a period of deflation before the uh, in uh, in revenues because the government imposes some kind of uh, open competition open architecture and uh, also then uh, you know put some price cap uh, do you think that is possible so see, uh, coming to price caps it is um, i believe it is more for politically driven so if you look at the price caps where it started from the cardiac stent, it was again you know, politically driven as there was some case that was there in the media and then that got enlarged. Then price caps on uh, H1N1 came when the disease was there and now there is no price cap on the H1N1 testing. Again, COVID uh, testing and COVID products, for example, masks, sanitizers, 
and even the COVID test have a price gap because again the government uh, doesn't want people to take advantage of it and there have been cases where there has been black marketing people have been hoarding masks and sanitizers and selling at a higher price and even uh, same thing would have happened in COVID testing if the government didn't uh, step in so uh, okay. I think price and price capping is more of a temporary uh, in nature and it will not uh, be there for a longer time once things return back to normal the government will remove the restrictions as it has done for even the exports mm -hmm. the restrictions once uh, India has built the capacity and more than the price cap is in the end the market competition will anyway drive down the pricing so then it will be up to the consumer like in every other industry they choose to go to a five-star hotel kind of lab which has a five-star kind of lobby or they choose to go to a regular lab so then that is what will drive the pricing in the market and as such if you look at uh, the pricing powers they are not under any act for the lab services the pricing cap is under the drugs and cosmetic act so the drugs and cosmetic act has no power over the hospitals or the lab they can only regulate the pharmaceutical industry and the medical device industry so legally there have been cases where the dengue price was capped by the delhi government and hmm. the lab went and fought the case and they won the case because the government said no you have no power to price this test because it doesn't come under any act okay understand sir thank you very much for your insight yeah, yeah. Uh, i appreciate it yeah. thank you sir to ask a question participants will press star followed by one as a reminder to participants if you wish to ask any question at this time please press star one We have, no, we have next question from the line of Vinod Birla from Reliance Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, just wanted to understand, as you have mentioned, that uh, uh, Reliance is being... Just wanted uh, some color on how will be the like uh, margins going forward in this business. So I don't see a pressure on the margins. So the pressure is going to happen when the test which is a super specialized test is going to become a routine test and then when that becomes a routine test there's going to be some other test which is going to come out which is going to be more uh, effective more accurate than the routine test so this is just going to be a cycle so something new will come old and then something else new, new test will come out like it's in the pharma industry right so your molecules which have been around for a long time, the patents are not expired, etc., and then the pricing comes down once it becomes generic, and then a new test comes out, a new molecule comes out, and that has a patent, and then the pricing power is higher. So this will keep continuing as there's always going to be innovation, there's always going to be new technology. So it's going to be a cycle, and I don't think the cycle will stop because there's always going to be advancement. Okay. So I'll give you an example, like the sugar test, right? It has been around hmm. for the longest time to check your sugar for diabetes effect. So that test, the pricing has come down, is one of the lowest price tests in the lab. So the sugar test, the pricing has come down, but then there are other tests which are, are still at a high price, for example, HbA1c test. So this test tells you what has been the average of sugar in your body for the last three months. While the sugar test just tells you what is the sugar in your body at the current time you took the test. So the HbA1c test is much more effective in the management for the patient because you cannot cheat on the test and the doctor knows exactly how you have been on your diet or exercise for the last three months. So the HbA1c test is still, the pricing is still on the higher side, it is coming down. But once the HbA1c test the pricing comes down, then there will be some other test come, which comes up which is more effective with uh, better accuracy and better sensitivity. Okay. 
ओके थैंक्स थैंक्स फॉर यू Thank you. We have next question from the line of Agarwal Shah from Tata AIL Life Insurance. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking a question. So I had a question. Wanted to know your thoughts on the competition from these online aggregators coming into the diagnostic space. So like one in the health and sector are now providing tests from the, under their own private label. So do you think that will be disruptive for the whole industry? It's more of the taking only on the value, smaller value test or more. Like thyroid care would be impacted, but the likes of Lal and Metropolis would be insulated. Thanks. Hmm. So uh, this online dominance is going to happen more now with uh, post COVID. Earlier it was not as active, and uh, there have been uh, health seniors who have been very active in this field. And earlier they were tied up with uh, companies like. Uh, Uh, the labs where they were just collecting the sample and then they were giving it to the lab and reporting back the result. The challenge with the online players will be that they need to give enough volume to get a lower test cost if they set up their own lab. But if they outsource it to, for example, Thyrocare, they get a much lower price from Thyrocare versus doing the test on their own. So till the time their volumes don't pick up, those a significant amount where they can bargain with the supplier and get a similar price to Faro Care it will be cheaper for them to outsource so it is a matter of time before the volumes pick up so like a trading comp- company start trading and then after once they have good volumes then they invest into manufacturing so the similar way the online players are going to work on volumes and once they have the volumes then they can set up the lab because they'll get Similar pricing to probably Thyro Care, and uh, Thyro they don't have to part away with their margins that they have to give to the, the chain labs, so their margins will automatically go up. And uh, this will continue, but then the only constraint challenge will be that a lot of the testing is prescription based. So if a doctor says that okay, this test you need to do in a particular lab, so there the online player will not have. much of uh, power even if it's pricing is lower hmm. so my second question was on the covid test so we only saw that it started off at rt pcr then the hmm. antibody test came in now we are hearing of quick test like based on saliva or blood drop etc hmm. so how do you see this phase panning out for the so let's say yeah. right now Like the thyroid test, starting 600 for antibody, and I read by my couple of colleagues. But as these new tests keep coming in, the duty of sharp price erosion as because now we don't require a qualified lab like my couple of colleagues to come and test in small standalone lab can do that. So what's your take on that? So each of these tests has a different utility. RT PCR, antigen, antibody. So RT PCR is the gold standard. it is the test to diagnose and start the therapy if you have covid 19 antibody test is more of a test done as a survey you are doing a survey to find out how many people in the population were affected by covid in the past and have developed immunity resistance to covid so that you know that okay this population was affected and now they have recovered from covid so it's more of conducting a survey to know that uh, you know as a country how many people are infected are we going towards herd immunity etc and if we have this data then we can decide that how you know what is the hospitalization required what is the bed capacity required for that purpose and the other test which is the antigen test it is created more for the rural india so an rt pcr is an expensive test and it requires time to be done so not all labs can afford an rt pcr especially labs in tier 2 tier 3 towns so for them to give more access to the people living in the rural areas the government has allowed an antigen testing which has a 50% chance of giving you the right result 50% of the sensitivity That means to pick up the COVID-19. 
infection in the body. But the government still feels like it is important to have something than nothing and the tier 2, tier 3, tier 4 towns will not have access to an RT-PCR so let us at least give them access to an antigen rapid test. So these three have different segments that they target to, targeted towards and with the price erosion happening at the labs it is also going to happen for the manufacturers. So as the volume picks up, even the manufacturing cost comes down. So for example, now a lab is buying a COVID antibody test at 300 rupees. But the, the real cost of that test should go down to 20, 25 rupees since the malaria test is costing the same. But malaria is made in huge volumes, so the test is able to, cost is able to come down. And COVID, raw material is a challenge. It's still, uh, there are very few companies who are making the raw, raw material for COVID. So as there are more companies who are going to start making the raw material in a larger volume, then the manufacturers will get lower price for raw material. They will be able to produce the product at a low cost. It will give the benefit to the labs. So labs will not see their market, uh, their profit eroding because they will get a lower cost and labs which have a strong brand they will anyways attract customers compared to labs which don't have a strong brand so they all operate in different segments so customer for example going to metropolis i don't think he will go to another lab for saving 100 rupees or 200 rupees no sir my question was most on the point that right now you are restricted to a few labs but now given the option that my neighborhood lab also gives me that test. I'll go prefer that because there's a no prescription based requirement as hmm. you just wanted to discuss it. So the market will so already about eighteen hundred labs are allowed to do the testing. And you are saying that more labs will enter the market, right? Yeah. So the more labs will enter the market, the more the market will expand. Because more hmm. people will have access to the test. Thanks. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We have next question from the line of Sagar Jetwani from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Sir, can you uh, comment on commission sharing by these local uh, diagnostic players and large players mm -hmm. like Dr. Lal and Metropolis? Mm -hmm. So basically, I'm not uh, directly into the lab business. I'm yeah. directly yeah. so in terms of the what it is and how it works, the morality, is just what I've heard from the market when, you know, we operate in the market. So it can range anywhere from 10% to 40%, right? So that's how the general market works. And this is not only in lab business, but even in hospital business where you get a referral patient coming in so this is common in the healthcare industry as such. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. As there are no further questions from the participants, I'd now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Vinod Modi from Reliance Securities for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Hi. We would like to thank you to uh, Mr. Thakur for his time as well as uh, for the party uh, all participation for this for their time. Have a good have a good weekend. Thank you. You can disconnect now. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Alliance Securities Limited, that concludes this conference call. Thank you for joining with us, and you may now disconnect your lines. <laughs>